If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, hunters and outdoors enthusiasts, have you ever had an experience or encounter in the woods or backwoods that left you feeling genuinely unsettled? Before I get into my story, I'd like to give a little background on how my dog grew up. His name was Fonzie because he had long black hair with a white patch on his chest. Growing up, he was my best friend and protector. He was a mix of Chow and German Shepherd, and if you have ever met a Chow, I'm sure you're well aware that once they imprint on you, they won't accept anyone but you, and they are fearless protectors, which was just multiplied with the mix of German Shepherd. On to my story. When I was eight, we lived in the foothills of Mount Baker in a not-so-populated area. One evening around dusk outside my house, Fonzie and I were up to our usual shenanigans. He would sit behind me as I shot my BB gun at some targets I had set up on the tree line when all of a sudden he moved in front of me and started growling, which only happened when he felt I was in danger. Right after he got between me and the tree line, about 20 feet, a very deep and loud, almost clicking sound came from the trees, limbs were breaking, and you could hear the ground pounding. We were both terrified, he started whimpering, which he never did, and we ran into the house. I looked out the window to see if whatever it was came out of the woods, but nothing emerged. I told my dad about it, but he didn't believe me and jokingly said it was probably Bigfoot, but I've never heard of any Bigfoot story where it charged someone. Black bears tend to stay away from loud dogs, and it was way too loud to be a cougar. So that's my story. I've never told anyone but my parents and wife. It was by far the most terrifying experience of my life and still haunts me to this day as a 31-year-old man. Back in 2009, when I was 15 years old, me and a friend were in the deep woods of Pennsylvania, behind his house, having a fire. Trees in every direction, we had our fire pit up on this hill where it flattens out. No booze or drugs were involved. I'm just bullshitting around this fire, and it's about 2 a.m. at this point. I'm walking around the edge of this hill talking about who knows what, and I stop dead in my tracks and go silent. I whisper to my friend to come here and see if he can see what I am seeing. At the bottom of this hill, 20 to 30 yards away, we see this glowing orange orb, a little bigger than a basketball. It was 4 to 5 feet off the ground and floating in one place. There was no noise, the glow was shining on the tree, it had energy to it, whatever it was. It lasted only 30 seconds and just diminished slowly, and it was gone. We stood there for a few seconds longer, just staring at where it was. No smoldering coals, no sign of anything. We did not go and investigate, being 15 years old, we got absolutely terrified and fled back to his house in the pitch black with only our flip phones to light our way. We made it back and just rattled our brains back and forth about what we just witnessed. I still get goosebumps telling the story, it was the strangest thing I've ever witnessed. I'm curious if anyone else had such an encounter. It was a very hot day in California today, but I decided to embrace the heat and embark on a hike. Less people are around on hot days. I chose a secluded trail I was familiar with, one that typically saw little foot traffic as well. As I arrived, I noticed no cars or people at the trailhead, confirming its quiet reputation. As I neared the midpoint of my hike, I suddenly heard a noise from behind. Turning around, I saw a young boy riding a bike. He had longish hair and was dressed in a style reminiscent of the 1970s. He swiftly passed me, but then, without warning, he stopped right in front of me and began to panic, clutching his chest. My initial reaction was suspicion, as I feared I might be the target of a robbery or a scam. However, as I observed him more closely, I realized his distress was genuine. Concerned, I approached and asked if he was okay and if he was alone. He confirmed that he was by himself. When I inquired if he had a cell phone, he responded with a puzzled no. I quickly pulled out my own phone to call 911. Suddenly, the boy stood up and assured me he was fine. He explained that he was born with a hole in his heart, which occasionally caused him pain. After thanking me for checking on him, he rode off as if nothing had happened. I felt very scared for him, the distress was the real deal, and I was shocked he was able to ride off. Upon returning home, I shared the story with my grandmother. She found it intriguing and mentioned that my mother's best friend from elementary school in the 70s had the same condition and had tragically passed away. A few hours later, my grandmother presented me with a photo of the boy alongside my mother, and he bore an uncanny resemblance to the one I'd encountered on the trail. Ever since my mother's passing a couple years ago, I've experienced a series of inexplicable signs. While I might have dismissed this encounter as a mere coincidence in the past, I now can't help but wonder if there was something more to it. What do you think? This happened a few years ago. A couple of years after moving into our house, I decided to hop over the fence and explore the woods behind us. I used to hear kids playing back there. 
I walked through about 20 yards of forest and came to a large clearing and a dirt road that ran parallel to our fence. The clearing was at least 100 yards deep and about 50 yards wide. There was one good-sized tree standing near the dirt road from which a tire swing was hanging, and bits of debris, plywood, and bricks around it looked like the kids from the neighborhood were making a fort or something. I didn't think much of it other than that it explained why I often heard kids playing back there. Fast forward another couple of years. I decided one day to hop over the fence again and go exploring. But this time, when I came to the dirt road, there was no clearing, no tire swing, and trees everywhere. They weren't saplings that had been growing for a couple of years, but rather, it didn't look like it had ever been cleared. It really freaked me out. I was about 15 at the time with my brother, 17, and it was pretty late at night. Now my grandparents' property is surrounded by woods on two sides, the left leading into a deep forest of evergreens and the behind short and ending at a lake with other houses within throwing distance. I've grown up my whole life in those woods, seen many critters, and was never really scared of them, they were more of a place of comfort and aloneness that I liked. But I digress. Back to the story. My brother and I were walking up the long driveway that ended at the road because we kept hearing noises like moving branches by the tree line and wanted to check it out. We both knew whatever was in the woods, be it a raccoon, possum, coyote, or whatever, that logically we could easily overpower and kill it. On our way back from investigating, I heard someone walking behind us, and I turned around to see. It was pretty dark, and the only thing we had for light was from my phone, which wasn't much. All I could see were two bright eyes staring back, maybe three or four feet from the ground. I don't know what it was particularly, but even now, thinking about it, just those eyes and their presence filled me with the most horrific dread imaginable. It's like all my blood turned to ice, and I couldn't stop shaking. It wasn't just basic instinctual fear, but absolute dread. I immediately grabbed my brother's arm and ran as fast as I could to the porch, which has a light that shines about 10 feet into the yard. Whatever this thing was followed us, and when I made it to the porch and turned around, it had stopped just outside of the light, just enough to see those ducking eyes. The way it swayed almost made me vomit. I've never seen any animal sway like that and move its head so oddly. This thing was too large to be a rabid raccoon or coyote. My brother and I quickly got inside, turned off all the lights, and hid under our blankets. I'm the kind of guy who likes to go for walks in the woods because it's normally peaceful here in the summer. It's really hot, so I was going at night. I have grown up in this area for a while. I am currently 20. A couple nights ago, I went for a walk in the woods at night, as one does in the summer. I knew I should have turned back a while ago before I got deep in the woods because it was quieter than usual, but I was stupid and kept going. When I got probably a mile deep in these woods, I came to a lake where people normally go fishing, and stuff was still eerily quiet. Not long after I got there, I felt something watching me. I had what might as well have been a kitchen knife in my pocket, given how large it was now. I did probably one of the dumbest things I could have done. I didn't bring a flashlight, so my only light was the moonlight. I didn't want to leave the lake area because I couldn't see what it was that was watching me until it came crawling out of the tree line. It looked like possibly a dog man, maybe a werewolf, maybe something else. It was furry, that's all I could say for sure, because my brain was focused on survival. I grabbed a hold of the knife that was in my pocket because I had no idea what this creature's intention was. But I was not looking to die that night. Now I was trying to get a size of it, but it was kind of hard for me to tell with it crawling, but once it stood up, it looks probably around 6 or maybe 7 feet. It was big, and it felt like it was staring right at me, so I did the only sane thing, back up and back up slowly. That wasn't really the smartest idea because the moment I started backing up was the moment it got onto all fours and started running towards me. And then I did a stupid thing. I turned my back and started running as well. The creature was faster than me, a lot faster, so it caught up to me really quick. And now I was back in the trees, so I couldn't see anything, but I could hear it. So I decided to stop running, and I already made myself look like prey. So I need to make myself look like a predator. I turned to face what would be attacking me, knife in hand, ready to go, and that helped me none because it wasn't in front of me anymore. So I turned everywhere and heard a sound, which I think was circling me, there could have been more than one. And I genuinely thought I was going to die before I heard this loud howl, which is what led me to believe again that they were wolves or dogmen, and I heard the sound of the creature retreating and running towards the howl but I can say for certain that I learned something at night. If you're going into the woods at night, have a gun on you and a flashlight. And if you don't hear anything in the woods, don't go in the woods. The other day I was at my parents' house, and we had been talking about the Mandela effect, as my dad and I have become quite obsessed with the topic lately. Well, 
that conversation eventually turned towards some creepy childhood things that happened to my dad that he likes to tell me about from time to time. This thing in particular is something that had slipped my mind until he reminded me. When my dad was a child, he lived on quite a large chunk of land. There was around an acre of just land, and then around back into the side were acres and acres of woods. This land is still in my family to this day, and I love it there so much. I used to visit there every weekend with my siblings, and lots of strange or creepy things happened there. Anyway, when my dad was a kid, he used to play in the woods all the time with his brother, until all hours. There was this one area deep in the woods that was void of trees that they used to visit often to play in. This was one of their favorite areas of the woods to visit. One night in the summer, before the sun was completely gone, they were headed toward their spot to play. But as they got nearer, they started hearing crows and people's voices. When they got to their spot, it wasn't empty. There was a huge, old house there with a wraparound porch, and crows hung around in cages. The lights were on in the house, and there was a woman in a rocking chair on the porch and a man with a gun standing next to her. They were having casual conversation like nothing was amiss, even though just the day before they didn't even exist. Naturally, my dad freaked out and shouted, they weren't here yesterday. The man noticed them, got really angry, and started to walk toward them. My dad and his brother ran away and went back home. He told me that the next time they found the courage to visit that spot, the house was gone. And this is something that continuously happened to him and his brother from time to time as they were growing up. Now, this story sounds made up. It sounds like something that he would just tell me to scare me, and I wouldn't have believed him. Except I know he wasn't lying. I know he wasn't lying because my sister and my half-sister experienced the same thing. When I was little, around six or seven, when we used to visit my dad's old house, my older sister and my half-sister, who I thought was my aunt at the time, used to go out and play without me sometimes while I watched Disney movies in the living room. My half-sister lived with my grandparents at the time, so naturally we spent a lot of time there. Anyway, that day I spent my time at the house because they just wanted some time alone. That night, around 7 or 8, I don't remember that well, my sister and half-sister came in through the door in a rush. My sister had tears in her eyes, and my half-sister was extremely excited. My sister told me that they had been playing in the woods and had come across a house that had never been there before. She said it was a big house, with a wraparound porch and crows all around in cages. She was really scared, and I know she wasn't lying, she's always been a really bad liar. At that point in time, neither of us had heard that story from our dad. I was too young to hear about things like that, and my sister was easily scared, so our dad didn't tell us anything like this until a lot later in life. So my dad and my sister both experienced the same exact thing, and neither of them have mental problems, so I'm almost certain it was no hallucination. My boyfriend and I went to Chester Creek today to hike and had something really unusual happen. We were hiking, and out of nowhere, this guy was following us. He looked young, maybe 20s 30s, white, and were both white if that matters, but had a very unsettling look when I would glance back and we made eye contact. He also had a huge backpack. We both got nervous, like we just had bad vibes, because it was literally just the three of us on this trail in the woods. So I stopped to tie my shoe, pretended to tie it, so the guy would pass us. So he did. Then, maybe five minutes later, the guy bent down to tie a shoe. So we were inevitably going to pass him again. But instead, I said super loudly, boyfriend, we should turn around, and we did. As we were walking back, I turned around and watched the man. He stood up for a second and watched us walk away, then turned around and went a completely different way on the trail. Like a sharp, fast, and hard 90 degree turn from where he had been heading prior to us leaving and basically disappearing into the woods. My first thought was, he knows he got caught. He had the expression of a child who got caught doing something bad. Also, throughout the walk, my boyfriend and I slowed down at a varied pace to try to get the guy to pass us because he made us so uncomfortable. But he always stayed 10 to 20 feet behind. We've been on literally hundreds of hikes throughout the US and never had this experience. This story happened over the winter. It all started as a normal night, and my friend CJ and I were hanging out just discussing our usual subjects, his weapon collection, video games, just normal things. We were sitting there, and another one of our friends called us and said, hey, do you mind if I hang out with you guys? We said sure because we were already bored out of our minds. I will call him Don. Don says, well, I got my car, and we can go shoot off our friend CJ's weapons. We all agree because we've done it many times, and we go to the middle of the woods and no one bothers us. We leave and are on our way. We thought we knew the way to the location we go to because we've been there constantly, but that was our first mistake. We ended up getting lost. This is crucial to the story. 
Thank God my dad's car at the time was an off-road Ford Escape. We went down this narrow path that was very winding and heavily wooded. At this moment, we also realized we crossed states from PA to WV. We finally believe we've made it to the path that we knew got us to where we normally go, but it wasn't, and all of a sudden, when CJ and I look at each other, we are both as pale as the winter moonlight that night. He says to me, do you feel like we are being watched? Me, who openly admits to being a Satan worshiper, believes in demons, and does some witchcraft, says, I do believe something is watching us, but it's not natural. Don starts laughing and says, well, we are near the place they filmed Silent Hill. We all nervously chuckled, it wasn't until our car stopped. Don's lights hit the path, and it's covered in snow. A giant flooded stream is in our way. He goes and says, one of us has to get out. I look at him and say, no chance, I'm getting out, and CJ says, nope, I'm not leaving this car, as he said that he loaded a silver cased round in his pistol and held it close. Don gets out, and he says it's actually nice out here, peaceful and quiet. I get out as well, and that's when this fog rolls in. It was heavy, and it was very unusual. That's when I looked over and saw a giant fresh blood mark in the snow. I call Don over, he looks at it, is taken away by what he saw, dismisses it, and says, an animal probably got attacked here, but I interrupt him and say, there's no prince, nothing. He turns to me and says, well, we gotta get across this creek, which isn't too deep to cross. We are finally all starting to feel like prey. We cross the creek and decided to turn around. Barely making it through this path that was made for quads, not a 04 escape. We finally got out, but whatever was waiting at the end of the trail was something I can't even explain. It was way too big to be a dog or wild, and it was making almost human-like screams. Its eyes were bright green. CJ and I discussed how it could have possibly been a skin crawler because there were deer around it, and the deer didn't even notice it, but we did. I'm staying in a cabin at the top of the Great Smoky Mountains right now, and some really weird shit has been going down. My cabin is pretty secluded from other cabins, so I have a lot of privacy, but it gets boring in the mountains all alone, which is why I've been going on daily hikes. I've seen nothing out of the ordinary, except for the occasional mountain elk. I have been hoping to catch sight of a bear, but I still haven't encountered one. Yesterday, though, while going on my daily hike, something that can only be described as strange happened. I had been around 12 minutes into my hike when I heard rustling in the leaves. I obviously thought it was just an animal or wind rustling the leaves, but I turned around and stopped to look anyway in the hope of catching a rare bear sighting. After a minute of waiting, I realized there was nothing there and just pushed it off like the wind. I continued on my hike, now about 20 minutes in, and heard footsteps behind me. It didn't sound like normal human steps, elk steps, or bear steps. It was just a noise behind me, directly behind me, but when I turned, there was nothing. The woods around me were empty, except for me and the wind. I decided it was just a woodpecker and kept hiking, this time paying close attention to my surroundings, so nothing could sneak up on me again. I was deep in the mountain woods at this point when I saw what looked like a shadow, but not just a normal shadow, a large, very black shadow with no particular shape, that appeared just behind me. I spun around, but nothing was there. The shadow was still there, though. I thought it might have been a tree, but I was in a clearer part of the woods at this point, where the trees were spread out a bit farther, and I wasn't near a tree. I walked away a bit, and as I did, the shadow vanished right before my eyes. I guess I was a bit freaked out, considering it was a clear day and there was not a cloud in the sky, so the sun wasn't being momentarily covered by a cloud. The shadow had just miraculously vanished on its own. I continued walking, and I was paying close attention to the ground at this point because I saw some poison ivy in this area and didn't want to step in it. Then, that same exact shadow, from half a mile away, appeared again. It just appeared right before my eyes again. I started speed walking from it and realized that the shadow was moving. Not just small movements like in the leaves of a tree shadow. It was advancing toward me quickly. I was terrified, to say the least. I was surrounded by all these shadows of trees, and only this shadow in particular moved. I stopped, and so did the shadow. I started making small steps, and so did it. When I moved, it moved. When I stopped, it stopped. Before you think it was my own shadow, this shadow could appear far from me and was not attached to me at all. I started, very slowly, walking towards it. Instead of vanishing this time, though, it moved towards me. I kept moving until the shadow and I met, but the shadow still didn't touch me at all. The large, disfigured shadow sat feet away from me. I sat there, staring at it. Suddenly, without any forewarning whatsoever, I flung backward and crashed into a tree. It hurt like hell, 
but I wasn't injured except for a small scrape on the back of my neck. The shadow then shot forward towards me, and I started feeling like I was being hit, and it happened repeatedly before I felt claws that started scratching my arms. I then saw a raccoon appear, and as soon as it looked in my direction, in the shadow's direction, it cowered, its head down, and ran. When the rustle of the raccoon scampering away happened, the attack abruptly stopped, and the shadow shot away into the woods, most likely afraid of being caught mid-attack. I got up and ran. Despite still being in shock from being flung into a tree and being vigorously scratched on my arms. I was bleeding and aching everywhere. I stumbled into my cabin and locked the doors. I didn't know what to do. Call the police. What was I supposed to say? I was attacked by a shadow. They wouldn't believe me, and they obviously couldn't find it. I took a shower, and when I got out, I was stunned to see that my scratch marks were gone. They just vanished. Needless to say, I'm confused as hell. If you want to go looking for yourself, go search through the Great Smoky Mountains in Pigeon Forge, but be warned, you might want to bring safety gear. As for me, I don't think I'll be hiking anymore for the remainder of this trip. Those in the Pigeon Forge Great Smoky Mountain area, stay safe. An experience I had back in the spring of 2018. I have had a few what could be considered paranormal experiences in my life, but this was the most recent and unnerving. I am an avid outdoorsman and love to hunt and camp around the Francis Marion and Sumter National Forests. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest to test out a new camper shell on my recently purchased truck. We found a secluded area off a dirt road, made dinner, and then packed it in for the night as soon as it got dark. Around 11 p.m. at night, I sat up and looked out the back of the truck due to my dog growling. In the distance, I saw what looked like hundreds of small white balls of light darting around, then hovering for a few seconds and slowly converging to our campsite. They looked just like the dust orbs you see on videos, but these were producing light in a completely dark forest. They soon surrounded my truck. It seemed like there were hundreds of them. They were a soft white light, and they didn't blink, lighting bugs were out early in the evening, but those were yellow and blinking. After 30 minutes of them floating around and concentrating around us, I finally worked up the nerve to open the truck and light a lantern, and they promptly disappeared. After turning off the lights and locking them back up, they came back. My son was fast asleep, thank goodness. I watched them until I finally fell asleep around 1am the next morning, when we tried to leave, the battery was dead on the new truck. There weren't any lights in the back cab where we would have used any power. A week later, I had to replace the electric control module. I am not sure if that is relevant information, but I thought I would add it. About a year and a half ago, I visited my parents in the Gettysburg area of Pennsylvania for Christmas. I went for a hike, by myself, on the Pole Steeple Trail in Pine Grove Furnace State Park to see the sunset. I had hiked this about five times prior with someone else, so I knew the lay of the land. This hike is miles and miles from any civilization. It's a small mountain with only one trail, no houses or buildings anywhere within 10 miles, and I saw no cars or anyone at all on the trail on my way up or down. So I get to the top of the trail to be on the lookout and watch the sunset, and everything's chill at this point. Then I started heading back down the trail before it got dark, and suddenly I heard this old-time country-slash-folk song playing from what sounded like a speaker from a fellow hiker. I thought it was weird that I had seen nobody else parked or anything, and it takes a while to reach the top. I kept going down the trail, thinking I would see someone, but nobody. As I moved, the sound of this song playing got closer and closer. Keep in mind that I have great visibility because it's winter and there are no leaves. So I keep going faster, and just as the music is so loud that it feels like I'm about to see the source, it just stops and goes dead silent. There are no sounds of anyone walking around at all, and if you hike a lot, you know how easy it is to hear anything, especially a human, near you when there are dead leaves under your feet. It is safe to say I was pretty terrified and got my ass down that mountain as fast as I could. Anyway, it's like a year and a half later, and my boyfriend is here visiting me. I told him about that weird experience, and he suggested I look up the history of the place. I just did this and found out that in 1934, three children were killed nearby, and their bodies were dumped in this small state park, near the trail. I can't think of any explanation besides something paranormal. When you think of creatures in the woods here in North Carolina, the first thought is bears, wildcats, etc. right? Well, that's what I thought, too. I have lived here my entire life. I can say now that I was close-minded about it. This was 17 years ago, when I was an impressionable young girl of 15, and it was Halloween night. My friend Steph decided to make me go spook hunting with her and her two other guy friends, Frank and Jeremy, and this is how it happened. 
I was just hanging around at my house at around dusk when I heard my mom talking to someone at the door and letting them inside. I don't move from my spot on the couch. I just waited to see who it was. It was Steph, I could hear her talking and mention going spook hunting. I was really uneasy about the whole idea, and I said I didn't want to go, and Steph asked why. I told her that when you go hunting for trouble, you will definitely find it. She just laughed in my face and made me go anyway. Our first stop was an old church I used to go to, and it was freaky at night, but that's a different story. I'm talking about our next stop. Panther Top. When I found out we were going there, I was upset because of all of the stories about what happens when you go to the top. My friend didn't believe me until we were on the old dirt road that leads to the top of the mountain, where there is a seed orchard. I was looking out of the window at the passing forest when I saw a huge bonfire in the woods in a small clearing. I looked closer and saw people hand in hand circling it, except they were too small to be adults. That is where that thought ended, because when I looked into the tops of the trees, I saw dead children. It wasn't physical, children. It looked like the ghosts of children who were attacked by panthers. There are many stories and accounts of seeing big black cats here in my area ever since I was a little girl. Anyway, when I saw the ghosts, I screamed and cried until Steph tried to get me to calm down. She said she didn't see anything. I rode in silence and in a sort of daze until we reached the top. Steph and her friends wanted me to go with them to look around, but when they opened their doors, a heavy feeling in the air made me not want to even step out of the truck. The three of them told me to stay in the vehicle until they got back. I sighed and looked to where they had disappeared into the woods. Then something weird came over me, and I started drawing in the dirt. I don't even know what it was I was doing when I heard Steph scream. My head shot up, and I saw her and the two guys booking it to the truck screaming in fear about two red eyes staring at them. In her haste, Steph grabbed my hand and yanked me to the truck as I glanced back. I saw them, two red, glowing eyes are about a foot apart. I screamed too at this point, and as I was pulling myself up into the truck, Something grabbed my long skirt and yanked me backwards. Steph screamed, and with all of her might, she dragged me in and slammed the door. As soon as that happened, we kicked up gravel in our haste to leave. We sped down the gravel road at top speed, but it felt like something was purposefully making us slow down. I was panicking as I looked out the back window. Steph saw my face as all of the color left it and froze. As we looked out the window, we heard hooves. Yes. Hooves. Right behind us, at 70 miles per hour. I looked forward to the driver, Jeremy, and he was scared. We finally made it to the bottom, so we went to rest for a minute at the church there and collect our thoughts. For some reason, we got unusually sleepy and fell asleep. It probably wasn't even five minutes before we felt the truck rock violently back and forth, waking us up, and on the condensation of the windows were weird markings I've never seen before. I looked over onto the top of the mountain where we were, and I will swear on a stack of Bibles at what I saw. It had a green glow. Needless to say, I have never been back there and never will be. There are some unexplainable things on that mountain. And I will never, ever go back there again. I didn't know until I got home and until my mom saw my skirt. It had a long tear in it where I was grabbed. So this happened when my sister and I were kids, and we went hiking in the woods in our backyard in North Carolina. We only had a few neighbors around us, and our house was surrounded by woods. It was a Saturday afternoon during the summer, and my sister and I decided to go hiking alone like we did quite frequently. We were both under the age of eight, but our parents let us go hiking alone. We loved exploring the forest and discovering new places. As we made our way through the woods, everything was fine at first. When we went to our favorite place, where we usually hang out, something didn't feel quite right. I felt an uncomfortable feeling like something was going to happen. I looked around at my surroundings, but I didn't see anything or anyone. My sister and I continued walking through the woods until suddenly we heard leaves crunching behind us, so we turned around to see what it was. There was nothing there, so we thought it was just an animal. As we started hiking again, we heard the leaves crunching, and as we turned around, we saw someone run and hide behind a tree. We could see their shadow coming from behind the tree, and it looked like a person. It was definitely not an animal. We both looked at each other and felt paralyzed by fear. We started freaking out and thought this person was going to kidnap us. I grabbed my sister's hand and told her to run. We ran as fast as we could back home. Once we made it home, we ran inside and told our parents. Our parents became worried and told us that next time we go hiking, don't go too far from the house anymore. I don't know who was following us, but it still freaks me out to this day. I don't know what they would have done to us if we hadn't run away. I grew up in rural North Carolina. I grew up in the woods, where there used to be a water mill. A family lived there back in the 1940s. The parents had two daughters and one son. 
Unfortunately, one of the daughters got caught under the water wheel and drowned. Ever since I was a kid, I always heard humming and low singing in the woods when I was out tromping them. But the one thing that really scared me one night was when I was older. I worked for the sheriff's office, and I had left work early one night due to being over a lot of hours, so I got home around 2 colon 30 ish, and when I pulled up, I saw the figure of a little girl standing right beside my garage. And when I got out of my car, she was gone. The next experience I had was when I was out hunting in the same woods. It was a super quiet, beautiful fall evening. I had just gotten down into my seat when, all of a sudden, I started hearing the same humming and singing I had heard multiple times over the years. But I heard what sounded like someone walking towards me. I looked everywhere and couldn't see anything. And I heard a laugh, but not the same laugh as before. So as I was climbing down my tree stand, a rock hit my boot. And once again, I heard the laughter. Now, mind you, the area I was hunting was about three miles deep in the woods, where there was no one around. So I brought my brother, cousin, and a few friends down there one night, and we were going to just sit and listen and see if we could hear anything. We were down there playing cards and joking when all of us heard what sounded like someone who was in distress. We all got quiet and listened, and we could hear what sounded like someone breathing heavily. And the thing that confuses me about that night is if it was the little girl or something more dark. Sometimes I think things are better left alone. These are my experiences from a case I've been working on in my role as a chaplain and demonologist for the Order of St. John. Before my visit, I was given a referral by our regional chaplain. They're responsible for ministry and chaplaincy support within a large city area. Chaplains are a community-placed role, whereas pastors and ministers work in churches, and typically priests work in an abbey or monastery, in our denomination, at least. I used to be a pastor, but I'm now a chaplain in the community. I'm an area chaplain, which means I'm responsible for a handful of suburbs and any of the Order of St. John's staff who work or live in these suburbs. The referral I was given was from within my area. I needed to go and check out a forest that someone had reported creepy goings on, which included strange noises, feelings of being watched, and strange signs. The community member also reported that they always had nightmares and bad sleep after visiting the forest, but didn't put this together for a little while. It's a nice, small forest on the edge of suburbia. It's secluded, so it's great for walking dogs. So naturally, I took my dog, and I also always take a blessed Teo with me. First visit. In my first visit, I found some strange things and heard some strange things. I found a bird with a broken neck next to a bag of rotting meat, opposite a small candle shrine in the forest. To me, this was a clear indicator of something human going on, although my job is to try and disprove the paranormal. But I have to admit that this immediately put me in the concerned camp. I continued to walk, and I found two more dead animals. One was a native eel that had its head cleanly cut off, and the other was a dead hedgehog that had sadly been bludgeoned to the point it was flat. My first assumptions were psychotic teens, homeless people, or attempted dark magic. There are also strange markings painted on the trees and on the path. I also noted that there were no wildlife noises present, but we are in a change of seasons, so pressure drops are common at the moment. However, I performed a blessing, which includes singing, and the birds were singing by the time I finished. I took the rotting meat and threw it in the bin. Second visit. For this visit, I came back armed with a Bible, a small wooden cross, and my uniform. Blessings are often not a one-and-done resolution. You need to bless something multiple times. Blessings are one of our most misunderstood tools, they're a security blanket, not a conflict resolution tool. This visit is when things sank in for me. I found large drag marks around the forest, many of which ended at the small shrine area where I had found the dead bird. This visit is also when I started to hear murmuring in the forest, which was barely audible. I also started to experience large movements around me, with one inexplicable movement in a shallow stream. The stream is about 15 centimeters deep, but something splashed in it, sending the water about a meter into the air. It was just strange. I also felt pressure on the back of my neck and back ribs, but this could have been anxiety-driven muscle tension. I walked through the forest with my cross drawn and prayed a small exorcism invocation whenever it felt appropriate, just to be safe. Third visit. This was the hardest one. When I arrived, the whole forest smelled horribly of death because of all of the dead animals. I assume there are some I missed, but I certainly found more. A decapitated rat, birds, and some mice. This time I had brought my prayer book of St. Martin to consecrate the area. When I entered the forest, it sounded as though people were using the track, so I kept the dog on lead. However, I never found anyone, the talking always seemed to be around a corner and just indistinguishable. When I began the prayer, 
I immediately started to vomit uncontrollably, and the sickly, sweet smell of death became unbearable. But I pushed through. I also constantly heard the movement of something large in the forest. I kept praying and vomiting until I finished the consecration, and the vomiting stopped. The smell of death also disappeared. I did the prayer again to be safe, and I did not vomit this time. Fourth and most recent visit. I returned, and the animals are either gone or decomposed, and the smell is completely gone. There were still strange noises and movements within the forest and water. We don't have large wildlife here, so the noises are strange, to say the least. But other than that, things seem to be coming together. I still felt stalked and still heard murmuring, but the activity absolutely seems to have lessened. I need to go back and pick up all the trash that has accumulated, bless it again, and fix the markings. My only experience of really high strangeness in the woods occurred a few years ago on Wachusett Mountain. I was with my sister walking her dog on administration road when we reached the main paved road that leads to the summit and proceeded to the summit along that road. After enjoying the view, we headed down the paved main road, and after about five minutes, everything went quiet and nothing looked familiar anymore. We have hiked this mountain hundreds of times on this road, and we both now feel lost. We kind of start panicking and walking faster, and we feel even more lost. We didn't see any other hikers, even though we saw probably 100 people on the way to the summit. So now I stop and say mentally to whatever is messing with us to cut the SHT and release us. Two minutes later, everything becomes normal again, and we are 50 yards from the descending administration road entrance. My sister's dog now starts staring into the woods, and we both smell the most awful smell we have ever experienced. Like a dead, rotting skunk with fresh feces. We literally have to drag the dog away from staring at that spot in the woods. We didn't see or hear anything where the dog was looking, but we made it back to our car in record time. I was hunting on my family's property that's in the middle of nowhere in northern Minnesota. I mean, it's just all pine forests and very few dirt roads. I was sitting on my deer stand and kept hearing weird tapping noises on my stand. At first, I thought it might have been a woodpecker or trees hitting the stand. I finally went outside to check, nothing was even near me outside. And I mean nothing, I didn't even hear any birds or anything. I went back to my stand, and tapping noises started again, but louder. The tapping had also moved to the entrance of my stand. I finally decided to text my grandmother, she was hunting in a stand about 1.5 miles away, and tell her about it. I guess she told my grandfather, because about 10 minutes later he texted me he was going to drive to the field. All the while this was happening, the tapping had progressively gotten louder on my deer stand. Once my grandfather arrived, the tapping disappeared. I still went back the next day to hunt in that stand, but I never saw any deer that season. Actually, I hadn't seen any animals that season. It always gives me chills to think about it. Luckily, this year I switched spots to a different area or my family's property and heard plenty of birds. Plus, I saw a few deer and got a buck. Rural northern Minnesota can be quite an eerie place, I'll say. This happened in northeastern Oklahoma within the Cherokee Reservation around 2008, at the beginning of the fall. Myself and eight other friends I went to school with had all met up at a friend's house to hang out for the night around a campfire and listen to music, etc. We are all about 15 or 16 years old. My friend had a trail that went maybe over a quarter of a mile into the woods, where it led to an open circle in the wooded area. There was a fire pit there with a single tree and another trail that led south from the opening, where we would be hanging out for the night. We sat around doing this and that bullshitting into the night, and may I remind you we are not partying? No booze, no smoke, nothing, just nine of us out in the woods having a good time. It gets around 230 or 3, and things change. We are all having a good time, and my friend John gets up and heads to the entrance of that south trail at the edge of the cutout to take a piss. I just happened to look up from the fire and turn to look at him, and up from him in the trail, this grey figure stood in front of him about 20 yards away. I asked him quietly if he saw it and he looked up and came back to the fire with the rest of us. My eyes are locked on this figure standing in the dark. This thing is about 7 feet tall and grey, with a static, cloudy look to it. Its legs started about where the bottom of one's chest plate would be, long, lanky arms that lay down almost to where one's knees would be, and black, hollow eyes with no mouth or nose. All nine of us are staring at this thing, and no one can move. Some started to cry, some kept their heads down, but I kept my eyes right on it. I looked at this thing while it stood there, looking right back at us. It moved horizontally to the right into the woods off the south trail, slowly moving around. It got to a part in the woods that, during the day, you could see was about a seven-foot rock wall. When it approached, it hovered over this wall with no struggle at all, and then it slowly backed off into the darkness of the woods. 
We stayed there till the sun came up, then we got out of there. We never talked about that until about 15 years later. Some of them became my best friends, and they can recall that night. I went to that spot a few times after that at night and never saw anything. Looking back, did we really see something, or was it a case of mass hysteria? I can still see it in my mind, clear as day. I don't know what would happen if I saw it again. My mom and I were visiting family and staying in a cabin at my uncle's ranch. There's a main house, a bunch of animal pens and fields, a dog kennel, and then the guest cabin across the lot from the main house. There are other homes nearby, so it wasn't super remote, but we were surrounded by forest, mountains, and fields. So, in the middle of the night, my mom and I are sleeping, and we both wake up because there's suddenly a really strong, weird smell permeating the cabin, we commented that it must be a skunk. Also, both of our dogs sat up and got restless but didn't bark or make any noise. I was having trouble getting back to sleep with the smell and getting the dogs to lay down again, so I went outside to have a cigarette. It was nearly pitch black out, but I could see my immediate area from a dim porch light. I was leaning against my car, and I started to hear someone walking across the gravel. From the sound, I presumed that the footsteps originated from the forest area behind the barn, then walked through the gravel parking area and turned toward the cabin. I thought it was weird that whoever it was seemed to have passed by the kennel, and the dogs weren't making any noise, none of the animals were, but I figure it had to be my uncle or one of my cousins out doing something. I was curious what they were doing out so late at night. I was tracking where the footsteps were from the sound as they were getting closer, and I was just waiting for someone to walk near enough that I would see who they were. I almost called out, but decided to wait. Eventually, I saw what appeared to be someone wearing a hairy, brown coat walking toward the field next to me. So, this is where it got weird. It was getting closer and was about to walk by me, parallel by about 6 to 10, feet. It was close enough that I realized that what I thought was a person in a hairy brown coat was actually the bottom half of a large creature on two legs. The bottom half, two legs and hindquarters, was about the size of an average adult and appeared brown. The top half, which I could only barely make out in silhouette, appeared black. I couldn't tell how tall it was in the dark. It just walked by and into the field that was next to the cabin. The gate was not open, I checked the next morning, so I would have had to step over it to get into the field. I kind of registered what I saw and thought that I should probably be freaking out, but I just went back inside and went back to bed. I did a little walk around the property the next day to make sure all the animals were there and unharmed, but I only told my mom about the experience. We ended up coming back the next month, and she told my aunt and uncle about it then. I fully expected them to make fun of me for talking about Bigfoot, but my aunt asked for some clarification and said that her sister had told them about seeing something similar. I grew up on an old farm in the Finger Lakes region. After my grandpa passed, we inherited all of his land. About 187 acres, mostly wooded, are right next to my dad's land. I was about 13 at this point and had already spent my childhood in those woods, and there was always a specific part of the woods that was right off my grandpa's land that always made me feel really unsettled and creeped out when I looked into it. Our land had been logged regularly every 20 to 30 years. The neighboring land had not, ever. It was a very thick, untouched forest. I was not allowed to go in there, and I didn't want to anyway. Hunters loved that land, and one of them set up his tree stand about 100 yards off our land. I remember him talking to my dad one night about some of the weird stuff he had seen in those woods. This terrified 13-year-old me, and I never went in there. Until I was about 20. I was bigger and bolder, and one day I decided to venture in there just to see what was going on. Not far off our land, I saw a really old stone foundation and what was left of a collapsed cistern. I approached and then stood there silently for a few minutes, facing my fears, I guess. Suddenly, my vision went dark, and I almost collapsed. I stayed composed and waited until my vision returned. I saw what I swear were three black figures standing in front of me, and then they disappeared a few seconds later. Then, I suddenly locked eyes with an enormous buck watching me from a distance. After a few seconds of eye contact, it grunted loudly and then dashed off deeper into the forest. My rational side thinks it was just blood pressure suddenly dropping or increasing due to fear and adrenaline, but it was definitely something super weird that I've only experienced a few times throughout my whole life, usually in moments where I'm scared shless or exhausted. Also, when I was about 23, I used to night walk in those woods almost every day. On clear nights, I could see clearly enough under the moonlight that I didn't even bother bringing a flashlight. I enjoyed doing that, and I got used to encountering black bears, sleeping deer, etc. The forest completely changes when the sun goes down. It's certainly not human hours. And again, 
I would avoid that part of the woods because I never felt safe there. Not during the day, and definitely not at night. One night, under a nearly full moon, I went for a walk again, without a flashlight. I approach that part of the woods and walk along with it, out in a clearing, to be sure I'm not getting lost. Then, out of nowhere, I hear three loud knocks against a tree. It sounded like somebody had a baseball bat, and they were whacking it against a solid tree as hard as they could. Boom boom, and I could hear the echoes moving through the trees. I stop and listen, and about 10 seconds later I hear it again, but this time it was slower and louder. I shouted, is someone ducking with me? And then the sound stopped. I was freaked out because it was literally 1 to 2 AM on a weekday and it wasn't hunting season. All logic left my brain, and I just ran back to my house. I still, to this day, 10 plus years later, can't figure out what that was. I've moved away now, and that land is owned by a younger family. I told the parents about that part of the woods, and my dad warned them too because he hates that place too, and he has been living on that land since the 1950s. I haven't talked to them in years, but their kids have got to be old enough to be curious about those woods by now. I hope they get just as freaked out as I did. For some reason, I have a serious craving to own an unlogged, untouched, pristine ancient forest. There's something mysterious about it. It's so hard to find in New York these days, or anywhere else in the US. Everything has been logged and destroyed. This is an experience that happened to me a few years ago at college. I still have no explanation for what I saw. I have had insomnia for years, and the best thing I've found is to just go out and walk for an hour or so. I've never had any fear of going out late as I am a rather large man, and this was pretty easy at my college because of the layout, which is a rather large loop with plenty of open spaces and paths that are always well lit. In the center of this circle, there was a large patch of forest that was unlit. Because of this, I had never walked the forest at night, but this night, for no particular reason, I decided to change my path and go through the forest. I've gone through this path enough times during the day, and its floor trails are clearly marked, with wooden bridges at points and metal plates on the trees all to designate the clear path. The only light I have on me is my cell phone, which is just the worst type of flashlight, as it's very bright but only reaches out maybe 10 or 12 feet. As I'm heading into the path, not more than a few minutes into my walk, I'm crossing the first bridge, and just as I am nearing the other side of it, I hear a snap from behind me. I turned around expecting an animal, a fox or a raccoon. Perhaps there were a fair number of them around the campus I've seen at night before. What I saw on the other side of the bridge between two trees was a figure standing at human height but rather formless. The tree to its right has a metal reflector dish marking it, but it was still too far for my flashlight to really catch. The hairs on the back of my neck raised, but I was determined to just face my fear and identify whatever was on the edge of my light. I took a step forward, just one, and I froze as my blood went ice cold and everything in my body told me to run. I just couldn't bring myself to take another step towards this figure, so I decided I would leave as calmly as I could, slowly turn around, and confidently walk away, continuing down the path at a steady pace. I wasn't even close to being halfway through the forest from here, but I did a good job of staying calm. I hadn't seen or heard anything until I was nearing the end. At this final turn in the forest path, I can clearly see the street lamp at the other end. Now, admittedly, this last part of the path is rather swampy, with the ground very quickly turning to mud. I kept my pace steady, not running or slowing, and in the corner of my eye I saw it again, that white, formless figure, but this time it was approaching me. I panicked but didn't run. I just kept my confident stride, determined to not let my fear get the best of me. 20 feet from the edge of the forest, I slip and twist my ankle, falling face first into the mud. The adrenaline in the moment carried me through, though, and I managed to just force myself back up and keep walking. As soon as I broke the tree line and made it to the sidewalk, I felt free, calm, and safe. I fell asleep shortly after getting home but had awful nightmares. The next day, I was feeling alright and decided to go back and confirm what I saw under the sun. My girlfriend and I made our way down the path into the first bridge. Now I had many markers to note where I saw the figure the first time, the bridge, the two trees, and the metal marker on one. I knew I had found the exact spot, but there was nothing between the trees. It was an empty space, and it was empty and clear for a good distance in both directions. The second place I saw the figure was an open clearing, the only thing of note was a fallen tree, but nothing near the height of what I saw. I never walked alone at night in that forest but kept up my nighttime walks around campus without incident. I had been in the forest at night with others multiple times after this and never noticed another figure. It's been a few years now, and I still don't know how to explain what I saw. Before my best friends and I were separated, one passed away, the other moved away, 
we used to ride around doing all of the haunted legend places within reasonable driving distances. Sometimes we'd drive a few hours, but most of them weren't scary, other than the adrenaline filled, hyped up did you hear or see that? That would cause us to get spooked. This one was different, way different. We were just out of high school, probably 20 at most, and we were looking for an actually scary place to visit. A lot of the people we knew knew we were into these kinds of things, so we'd always get tips on where to go. There were the original three of us that day, and another friend wanted to tag along. After a little drive to our destination, about 45 minutes, we stopped at a Wawa to get gas and grab a few snacks. Like I stated earlier, we were all about 20 at the time, so we were all hyped up because we knew spooky time was getting close. We'd always pick on that other friend that tagged along, nothing harsh, just AHH, you're scared. So I believe it was me who said something along those lines that was overheard by a few people. It got the attention of a few people in the Wawa, including these two creepy older guys, who seemed like they didn't fit in. Their clothes were all beat up and dirty, and they just didn't seem right for the area, and the time was probably 8pm on a Saturday night. What's the little one scared of? I asked one of the guys. I say little because the three of us are all abnormally tall, the shortest between us three was 6 feet 4 inches, and he was of normal height, probably about 5 feet 9 inches. We replied and explained how we got tipped to go to this road because it's haunted. They replied that it wasn't that scary, and if we wanted a real scare, we should go to this random road. I forget exactly what it was called. But apparently there's this random memorial statue for a plane crash in the middle of the woods that crazy things are supposed to happen at. We grabbed our stuff and didn't think anything of it. As soon as we left, the group started talking and decided to go down the other road that those guys had hyped up. I know, a typical horror movie. What not to do? So we got to the entrance of the road, and it already did not disappoint. Woods on both sides, not one damn street light in sight. And I remember there was like a detention center off to the right. In the middle of nowhere. So the spooks already began the second we hit the entrance. We decided to drive down the road and search for the statue. We noticed that there were trees cut down on the side of the road, laying parallel to the shoulder of the road. We finally found the statue. About five minutes go by of silence, and we decided to enhance the scare factor by shutting the lights off. About a minute goes by, and we see a shadow figure pop out from the statue. We all freak out as it starts walking towards us, but it was making movements that no human would be normally capable of. It was dark out. But this thing was black. It was darker than the woodsy sky, so we could make out some of it. This thing was huge. Like I said earlier, we were all extremely large compared to the average guy, but this thing would have dwarfed any of us. We decide to peel out of there and continue down the road, figuring it would lead us out of there. Boy, were we wrong? About three minutes go by, and we hit a dead end, which in this case was an open spot in the woods with sand everywhere. The cutout was massive but surrounded by woods. There were different cutouts and ways to go from there, and I'm pretty sure the road continued after this cutout, but we were pretty deep in the woods at this point. So we decide to turn around there and, obviously, leave. After we turn around, we stopped just to take in the eerie feeling. The other three guys were talking about the shadow we saw earlier, while I happened to catch something out of the corner of my eye. About 40 feet away from me, I see what appears to be a white face, and then another, and another. All surrounding the car. The other guys didn't see them, and I'm rarely scared, but seeing me panic, they knew something was up. My panic caused them to panic. All panicking now. We then floor it far away from the sand turnaround. We get about half a mile down the road, somewhat near the statue, and pull over to gather our composure to get out of there. When we stopped, I swear I heard the typical ghost do noise. This was now turning into a movie, I wish I was never a part of it. So we are really scared now. After finding the way we came, we started heading back out. Remember those trees I talked about earlier? They were now laying in the middle of the road, blocking us in. As we all see the white faces, masks? That I saw earlier. Thank God my one friend, the driver, was good at driving and valued safety over his car. We drove on the edge of the woods, and it felt like we were defying gravity to speed our way out. The car was literally sideways, on the edge of the woods. I mean, I could literally stick a single finger out the window and touch the trees. We all made it home safely that night. After doing research, we found out that that spot was notorious in that area for crazy things happening, such as body dumps and murders. Because of the shadow and the ghost noise we heard, my head, heart, and gut tell me that that place is actually haunted, as previously stated, that place is famous for dumping bodies, along with a plane crash 100 years ago, so there's bound to be some spirits there.
I think where we were that night was actually haunted. We just happened to be there on a night where there were more things going on. I can't say for certain, but I'm 99% sure we survived one of their setups that night. But I'm 100% sure I will never go back again. I got chills just typing this, and I never tell this story. There were four of us there, one took our story to the grave, and I'm sure the rest of us won't speak much about it either. Whenever we even bring it up in front of people, we always use the code THMTW so that we don't have to actually talk about it. THMTW, of course, stands for the horror movie that wasn't. My friend and I are still trying to process exactly what we saw the other day. We've talked it through countless times, trying to logically figure out how this was possible. Hopefully someone on here can give us some thoughts and ideas as to what actually happened. So I recently purchased a small bass boat, and my first mate leg of and I have been super eager to explore the lake and its islands, as well as learn the fishing around it. We're new to Tennessee. Yesterday, on the 4th of July, we decided to go fishing in this very secluded part of the lake we named No Man's Land because of the low-hanging bridge that prevents boaters from entering the section. My boat can make it underneath because of how small it is, but I've never seen another boat in there. We decided to go deeper into the cove than we've ever been before. As we're slowly trolling down the lake, the path before us splits into three forks, and I ask which fork we should take. Legov immediately says the middle one, so we continue straight as the water changes from a large lake to a narrow river-like path. This is where a chain of events happened in quick succession, and we've talked through it after the fact to try and recall the order of how this went down. First, we heard a weird vocal-like noise coming from the woods beyond the shoreline, and we both tensed up and felt very uneasy. What was that? Legov asked. A dog, I said, as that was the first thing that came to mind. I don't think that was a dog, Legov answered immediately. Then we saw a bird high above us perching on a branch, staring at us. Maybe it was that bird, Legov said. Yeah, maybe. I answered. I'm not sure when it got into my hand, but at some point I drew my pistol and held it down at my side. Legov held the fishing bow. We both had a very weird feeling as we drifted down the river, our eyes glued to the bank. We came to a rotting pine tree that had fallen and was now half submerged in the water, sitting on the shoreline. Then it happened. We hear a very loud, heavy-footed animal running through the woods, getting closer to the water. At first, I thought it was a deer, as it was almost prancing, but as it got closer and louder, we both realized it was, in fact, not a deer. It was a very large, jet-black canine. My brain thought, oh, it must be a coyote, but this was much bigger, like a huge German shepherd and it was fast, like a black shadow, leaping through the trees and quickly approaching the bank that we were floating across from. It didn't seem to have any texture or details, though, almost like it was flat and blurry. We couldn't see fur or its face and eyes, just the outline of its body and tall wolf-like ears, but it was obviously the body of a canine. Adrenaline started rushing through us, and my brain raced, thinking we were about to have to defend ourselves. It almost looked as if it were charging at us, but it was zigzagging and dodging through the trees toward the exact portion of shoreline we were floating past. We were scared, but the 15 feet of water between our boat and the shoreline gave us some confidence. It would have to swim out to us, and I didn't see that as likely. It continued its leap through the woods and quickly reached our portion of the shoreline. In one majestic, fluid motion, it leapt off the shore and dove into the water right under the half-submerged pine tree in front of us. Stomp, 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 splash. That was it. We held our breath as we waited to hear it swim or move toward us. Small ripples reached our boat from the splash. After the fact, Legov swears the splash should have been much bigger for a creature that size. Watch for it to come back up, I whispered. I had never heard of canines being able to submerge themselves underwater, but here it was happening right in front of our eyes. We waited. Nothing. Silence. Just the subtle sound of the ripples made it slowly dissipate. We waited about 20 more seconds, and still nothing. It was almost as if the entire forest had shut off. Silence. Our eyes were glued to the fallen pine tree it dove under. Maybe it's just standing in the water under the tree, Legov says. We get the courage to troll the boat a little closer to inspect the tree, but there's nothing. There was no sign of anything. At this point, we're in complete shock. Stunned. It's gone. How could it be gone? How does something that big just vanish? especially a huge creature like that. After 30 more seconds of silence, Legov breaks it with, you saw what I saw, right? A shiver flashes down my spine. All of it, I reply. Really though, what the duck was that? Legov said. I replied, I think we saw a demon, and we both nervously laughed. We stay floating near the shoreline in shock for at least another 10 minutes, 
hoping for a sign that we weren't crazy. Legov scoured the waters, looking to see if it would come up for air. It never did. How the hell could a big black wolf-like creature disappear into thin air, or water, for that matter? Being skeptics, there has to be a logical explanation for what we saw, but we can't find one. If it had just splashed the water and gotten out again, one, we would have seen it walk away in whatever direction, and two, we would have heard it as anything putting weight on the leaves makes a loud noise. But it was just silence. The loudest of silences. We live in Middle Tennessee, if that helps at all. We're still a little shaken up by this. This is 100% true. We are not bullshitting you. Any insight would be much appreciated. I think I may have traveled to a different dimension. A couple days ago, my family and I took a walk in the backyard. When we walk back, it's a forest, there is a hill going down, a little ankle deep stream at the bottom of the hill, then another hill going up on the other side of it. We walked along the stream, probably five to six houses from ours, and we found a ravine extending off of the main stream. There was a tree in front of the ravine we had to step over. A couple feet into the ravine, there were these flowers all in the water, a large rock with moss, I remember this because we were joking around about how we could sell the rocks for hundreds of dollars and the moss rocks for even more because at a garden shop near our house the rocks sell for a couple hundred, and my dad also found a butterfly wing in the water, so we picked it up and put the wing on the ground next to the water. We walked up the ravine a little bit, we stopped because we were approaching houses, then we walked back to the mainstream, and everything was fine and dandy. The next day, yesterday, I went to the backyard again, but this time by myself. I walked up the main stream and found the ravine my family walked up, and I said, hey, that's the ravine or stream we walked up yesterday. I continued walking up the main stream because I wanted to see what was beyond it. As I was walking, I saw another ravine on the same side of the first ravine. There was no tree in front of this one. I started to walk into it, then I decided to wait until after I finished walking the main stream. So I made it to the end of the main stream, where there was a tunnel where the water flowed from and a lot of sticks. I started to walk back and my plan was to go explore the second ravine I found. I walked into the second ravine, and then I noticed the same flowers, rocks, and even the same wing on the ground. I thought it was the second new ravine I found because there was no tree I had to step over. I thought to myself, maybe I'm in the first ravine from the other day, but there was no tree. So then I thought maybe there wasn't a tree in front of the first ravine like I had thought, but then I pulled up a picture of the first ravine and there was a tree. In the picture, there was a tree, but in real life, there wasn't. Also, if it were the second ravine, why would the wing, flowers, and same rock be there? I was a bit freaked out and very confused. I decided to walk back up to the end of the main stream, where the tunnel was, to see if there really was a second ravine. I looked very closely on my way back up, then back down to the first ravine. There was no second ravine, even though I walked into a second one. Also, the second ravine I saw looked different because it had no big rock, it turned the opposite way from the first, and it had no tree to step over, which is why I thought the one I walked into was the new one I found because there was no tree. I made sure it was really the first ravine because the wing, flowers, and rock were there, and the tree was back. I was really creeped out and extremely confused by what just happened. I decided to walk back on the main stream, back to behind my house. I decided to walk up the hill on the other side of the ravine for a bit to explore around up there a little. As I was walking up the hill, I got three texts from my mom. She was like, where are you? Are you okay? Etc. I was confused why she texted so much, and I said, I'm fine. Why? She said she was worried because she said I had been gone for almost two hours. The distance I walked at the pace I was walking would not have taken me two hours. Even with the few breaks I took, it would have taken me 40 maybe 45 minutes at the very most. I was so confused as to why that much time went by because it wouldn't have taken me that long to walk the distance I did. So what happened with the tree disappearing, with the second ravine I started to walk into disappearing, and all that time that went by? Am I going crazy? Did I travel to a different universe? Is there a logical explanation for this? What happened? I'm so confused, and I want to know what other people think about this story. My husband and I were hiking to a small lake off of a logging road in Colorado. It was a very short out and back, about 4 miles total, and we were the only cars in the small dirt lot at the trailhead. The trail followed an old mining road and had a steep incline on one side and a granite ridge on the other. We both felt very off, but foolishly kept on hiking, eager to see a remote lake. At one point, my husband saw a shovel leaning against a tree on the granite ridge but chose not to tell me. Before the lake, the trail narrowed and led us through a thicket with the lake on the other side. 
Right before the thicket, we stopped in shock. The dirt trail was completely torn up, and there were man dug holes. They were large holes, about one to two feet deep. We should have turned around immediately, but we again wanted to see the lake on the other side of the thicket. So we walked around the holes, got to the lake, and paused to take a few pictures. We weren't going to bother relaxing at the lake because we were both very unsettled by the holes. As we turned to leave and headed back through the thicket, we both stopped and looked at each other. The look we exchanged confirmed we both smelled it, cinnamon gum strong enough that the person chewing it had to be close. There was a little wind, and turning around after the lake must have blown the smell our way. We silently walked back through the thicket and back over the holes in the trail that now seemed much more ominous. The hike back was a terrifying two miles. My husband, 6 apostrophe 3, pulled out his foraging knife, and I did too. I also pulled out my bear spray, I keep it around for people more than bears when hiking alone. We both assumed our tires would be slashed when we got back to the parking lot, but, thankfully they were not. Once we were safely away from the trailhead, my husband told me that he thought he saw someone tracking us from the granite ridge line on our way back. The lesson is that if it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't, and you should leave. This happened a long time ago. I was 12 and in my grandparents' village. We had a cow and an ox. Usually the son of the bull, usually just one, took all the cattle to graze, and at night he would take them back. Cows know where to go when going home. My grandpa had a male ox, and since my father was an adult and he wasn't there, I took the responsibility. Basically, my job was to go around the village with the ox trailing after I called the people to open their doors. Our ox would grunt to call the herd, and all the females came out. From then on, I had to take them to a clearing up the mountain and then later take them to the river. It was easy. The animals already knew where they were going. They were calm, and our bull was a gentle giant. All I did was ride him and have a thin rope on his horns. If any of the females wandered off, all I did was call or, on rare occasions, poke her with a dull stick in the right direction. My grandpa said that if I see a wolf, very rare, a boar, or a fox, I should stay on the ox. Not many animals dare go near an ox herd. There is a dark part of the forest where it is very quiet, and even the bravest hunters won't go. It is very slippery and dangerous. They said that even the deer and boar dare not go there. I was forbidden to go there, and honestly, I never wanted to. It was an early morning, and everything seemed fine. I was on the ox, going up the mountain. I was glad he let me, because it was a hard trek up. I saw that one of the females was wandering off. I followed her and left our ox and the dogs to guide the herd. She went into the forest. I ran to her and got started tying the rope to her horns. I tried steering her away, but she continued. She went into the dark part and stopped. I didn't want to get off in case she ran back and left me there. I heard a crunch and turned. A very old man was walking towards us. He looked frail, with dirty clothes and a long beard. I was scared, so I laid on the ox, clinging to her, not wanting to fall if she ran. Oxen aren't like bulls. They don't jump or kick when scared. They either attack with their horns and trample or run. I was ready to hold on, no matter what she chose. Our oxen didn't take kindly to strangers before I took them out. I had to go to every house and have the ox owner introduce me to the animal. That way, they saw that their owner trusts me and their herd leader, our ox, trusts me. I knew she would either attack or bolt. But she just stood there. The stranger came to us and petted her on the head, whispering something I didn't understand. He looked at me. His eyes were completely white. Then he turned around and left. He just disappeared in the trees. Suddenly, the female grunted as if she had just woken up, our male makes that noise every morning, and bolted the way we came from. We found the herd. I quickly got on our ox and yelled water. He knew that command and went down towards the river, there were houses there, and it was closer than home. I barged into one of the houses and tried to explain. The couple there stayed with me and sent their daughter to call my grandpa. I couldn't sleep for days, remembering those white eyes. My grandparents didn't let me out of the house for the garden, and I wasn't allowed near trees. Later, I learned they were protecting me from a lesbian. A forest spirit can take the form of a man, an owl, or a wolf. It hurts when people go into his part of the woods and can kidnap you. I later learned that the ox that took me there had fallen ill and died. It sometimes stays in the trees as an owl, looking for the offender. For years, when I went to my grandparents, they wouldn't let me be alone. Not just outside but inside too. I am never going into these woods again. I grew up on a remote ranch, 60 miles from the nearest town. It is located in one of the larger cluster areas in the Rockies, near the Rawa Range and Poudre Canyon, a case of a missing boy was highlighted in the first documentary. 
It's also not too far from Rocky Mountain National Park. Since we were so remote, I was homeschooled, meaning I spent most days of the year there and extensive time in the forest and hiking the mountains. Unexplainable and incredible things absolutely do happen in the wilderness. My life experience has made me very attuned to it, and I have a keen sense of when something isn't quite right. It is very common for people in the region who are ranchers, outdoorsmen, and women, most understand it, and many have stories. The most common occurrence that I've witnessed and that others have are the lights. As a child, this was so common that I assumed it was normal and didn't realize it wasn't until I got older. There are two types that I have most commonly seen. The first are purplish floating orb types. These tend to be smaller, basketball size, and float along ridgelines and creeks, and sometimes they can be seen dancing through trees on a mountainside. I've witnessed this quite a few times on the family ranch, and as an adult, I've seen them in Grand Teton National Park and nowhere else. I'll note that this phenomenon seems harmless, even beautiful. The second type are the orange fireball lights. These seem to be different and can be quite alarming. I have witnessed these twice in an area in Wyoming that is well known for amazing granite boulders. One night, my boyfriend and I were watching the Leonid meteor shower. We had parked by the side of a dirt forest service road, with a mountainside behind us and a nice vista in front. We started seeing what looked like orange headlights in front of us and assumed it was a car driving up, even though it made no sound. The headlights turned off, so we assumed a car had stopped and didn't feel any alarm. Shortly after, we started seeing more orange lights kind of pop on and off throughout the area, long distances from each other. Then we noticed the same thing on the mountainside behind us. We were puzzled, were they flashlights? Was someone lost? They intensified in the number of lights and the frequency of them going on and off, and they were getting closer and closer to us from all sides. My boyfriend started panicking and yelled at me to get in the truck, and he tore off out of there terrified. It was actually really scary, but I was more in awe of his reaction because he was the biggest, most stubborn skeptic I have ever met. My second experience I was home alone at a house I was living in near the area, just outside of town, so pretty dark. I stepped outside for a cigarette, and as usual, I was stargazing and looking around. I noticed a somewhat large orange light just above the tree line at what looked like maybe half a mile away. I always try to logically figure something out, so I thought maybe a new light pole went up. As I was looking at it and thinking about it, it started moving rather swiftly and silently towards me. When it was getting closer, it almost looked plasma-like, it's very hard to describe. Just as it got to the property line, it flashed white and morphed into a white diamond, then morphed again into what looked like three orange balls connected, with the middle one slightly larger. I was frozen, then utter panic and fear took over. My inner voice was telling me, this thing is going to ducking fry you. I'm typically pretty stoic in the face of weird stuff, trust me, I've seen a lot, but this thing was menacing. I ran inside and hid in my closet like a chicken. This one experience is the main reason I no longer camp alone. In the early 1980s, I was a recently promoted crew boss on a small fire crew of five people. This was my first assignment on a fire as crew boss, though by then I already had several years of experience as a crew member and lead firefighter. A lightning storm had ignited several small fires in the coastal mountain range of southern Oregon. My crew was assigned to one of them. We were flown in by helicopter, as the fire was in a designated wilderness area, there was no road access, and the nearest trail was several miles of tough cross-country hiking. If you are familiar with that area, you understand that the terrain is very steep and rugged, and the forest is dense with lots of understory brush, making bushwhacking very difficult. So a helicopter is the only practical method of transport. We landed in a small clearing on the ridgetop, within a short walk of the fire. We arrived late in the afternoon, almost dusk, and spent two days putting the fire out. Late in the afternoon on the third day, I called on the radio for transport, and a small helicopter was sent. I sent the other four back on the first trip, and I, being the boss, intended to be the last one out with the remainder of our equipment. About the time I expected the return, the station called me to report that the helicopter had a chip light, a warning light, and had to shut down to check it out. They promised it would be back for me in a few minutes, but I knew it would not be back before it was too late to fly, as the sun was already below the horizon. The Forest Service does not operate helicopters at night except in dire emergencies, and retrieving a firefighter from an already extinguished fire is not an emergency. So I prepared to spend the night. My gear pack still had a bit of food, and I had warm clothes and a lightweight tarp, so I was not worried about spending the night. I had been in this situation before. I was just finishing up the last of my food in the remaining daylight when I heard a rustling in the tree line at the edge of the clearing, maybe 20 yards away. My first thought was a deer or bear, probably a bear, as deer normally do not come around fires. 
the commotion and noise seemed to drive them off. Bears, though, seemed to be attracted to fires, perhaps smelling our food. I was not particularly alarmed, we occasionally see black bears in the woods, and they can normally be frightened off by just yelling, waving arms, and throwing sticks at them. There are no grizzly bears in this area. I kept looking towards the sound, trying to make it out in the little light that was left. I had a flashlight buried deep in my pack, and I did not take the time to dig it out. It finally stepped out of the brush into the clearing, and I immediately saw it was not a bear, but I could not figure out what it was. Somehow my mind finally fixed on it being a bird, standing upright on the ground with its wings folded. But what a bird! This thing was huge. About six to seven feet tall. It was a dark color all over, there were no bright color spots I could see, although it was pretty dark by then. The head, or beak, was long and came to a slender point on both the front and back. I could not figure out what kind of bird it was. It was too big for a vulture, and the head shape was not right. It wasn't a crane. They are not this big, and cranes like marshes, meadows, and water. None of which were anywhere near. This bird was looking right at me, not moving. After a few minutes of staring at each other, it started to walk towards me. I somehow got the impression it had sized me up and was getting ready to attack. I grabbed a Pulaski that was just at arm's length, a firefighting tool, combination axe, and mattock. I held it with both hands over my head, just like I was getting ready to chop. It stopped walking and again just stared at me. I yelled something like go away while swinging the Pulaski over my head. What happened next totally scared the hell out of me. It unfurled its wings and spread them. The wingspan was huge, maybe twice as wide as it was tall. And they did not appear to be feathered, just skin or leather stretched over a skeletal frame. It took a couple of hopping steps towards me, then leapt into the air. It flew directly over my head. I felt wind from the creature's passing, and it may have brushed up against the head of the Pulaski as it flew over. As it flew off into the darkness, I suddenly recognized the bird. It looked just like the pictures of one of those flying dinosaurs. I could not believe what I saw. I built a large fire in the middle of the clearing and did not go to sleep that night. I spent the night gathering wood and trying to convince myself it was something else, with the darkness and shadows playing tricks on me. After all, those things have been extinct for millions of years. At dawn, I put the fire out and called on the radio to ask when I would be picked up. They told me about an hour. I spent that time going to where I saw the creature the previous night. I saw a set of large tracks. I thought they looked like huge turkey tracks. The helicopter finally came. I loaded up the tools and gear and climbed in. On the flight back, I kept looking around for the creature but did not see anything. I finally asked the pilot what the largest bird he had ever seen was while flying around here, and he said, I dunno, maybe a vulture or eagle. I asked, ever hear of anything larger around here? He said no, then, after a second, he added, wait. I heard another pilot once say he thought he saw a bird as large as a small plane, but no one believed him. Why do you ask? I thought I saw a really large bird last night, but it must have been just a vulture or something like that. We were both quiet for the rest of the flight. Later, after returning to my station and doing the usual paperwork, I took the rest of the day off and went to the local library. After searching for a book on dinosaurs, I saw a picture of the same creature I saw the previous night. It was a pteranodon. A few weeks later, the helicopter pilot approached me and quietly asked about the conversation we had in flight. Was I serious about seeing a huge bird? I said yes but did not mention it being a pteranodon. He said someday he may tell me of something he has seen in the area several times, but not now. I suspect he was the another pilot he mentioned earlier. One of the members of my crew was a young kid just out of high school who had a habit of telling tall tales. We would just laugh at him when he told one of his whoppers, and he would get upset and swear it was true. So I did not tell the story to my crew, out of deference to him or because I feared the same treatment. As my career progressed, I just put it further and further back in my mind, thinking someday I would tell my co-workers, but I never did. As I moved up the career ladder, I moved around the western US several times. In my last promotion, I replaced an old-timer who retired. I knew him from back in the 80s, when we briefly worked together on the same unit in Southern Oregon. We renewed our friendship when I replaced him. At my retirement party a few months ago, we both lingered in the room as the well-wishers left. Finally, it was just the two of us and a couple people starting to clean up. I finally motioned him over to a table in the corner, and we both sat down. I finally asked him, when you worked back in Siskiyou, did you ever see any really large birds in the area? He replied, what do you mean? I then told him a brief version of my encounter. He sat there for several minutes, staring at me. I finally started to say something, and he immediately put up his hand to cut me off. 
After several more awkward moments of silence, he turned his head to look around, as if to see if anyone was listening. He lowered his head and said in a quiet whisper, Yes. My experience is similar. There is something in those mountains. But I quickly learned not to speak about it. I asked why, and he said, People get upset when you talk about it. Influential, powerful people. I started to say something, and again, he held up his hand to cut me off. What you saw, what I, we, saw, is not supposed to exist. Others have seen them too. No one talks about it. You should not either. With that, he congratulated me on my retirement, got up, and left. This had to have been at least 12 years ago. I was in Alabama, and my cousin wanted to go camping near an old wooden covered bridge, so he called his friend Drew to come with us. My cousin wasn't sure where the place was, so by the time we found it, we had just enough light left to set up the tent and start a fire. We were near a slow-moving river that made a bend right where we were camping along the shore. On the opposite side of the river was a sheer rock face, I'd guess 90 to 100 feet high. Many beers into the evening, we decided to crash. All three of us woke up several times in the night to hear what sounded like rocks being rolled down the side of the cliff. I say rocks, but boulders may be slightly more accurate due to the sound of the splashes. It was obviously something very large and very heavy. We would have thought someone was just ducking with us, but the size of the boulders required to make that ker-plump type of splash would have been too large for humans to move. We never found our way to the woods on top of that cliff the next day. I think they were too scared, honestly. So yeah, that was ducking creepy. I do, however, wish we'd found a way to the source of where those had to have fallen from. My husband and I moved into our camper van back in October, and our first stop was to visit family in West Texas and then on to Arizona for a music festival. After the music festival ended, we decided to hang around Tucson for a bit and see the Gem and Mineral Show before heading north to Flagstaff and then the Grand Canyon. While heading to the Grand Canyon, we found an awesome boondocking spot in the Coconino National Forest. It was on this small forest service road that only had two spots, and one was occupied, a man and his young son, who I assumed were spending the day in Sedona about 45 minutes away and retiring early to their RV, before you crossed into private land, and we snagged the last spot before crossing, which was awesome. It was perched up on this hill that had been leveled at the top, and you could see all the mountain ranges surrounding you, with the ranch fence next to us but the ranch being over the next mountain in the valley. There were wild cattle around, and the landscape is absolutely breathtaking, so much so that I spent most of the day just staring out at it. It is an extremely remote place as well, which we love because we love stargazing and privacy. We go to bed early most evenings around sunset and wake up around sunrise with a middle of the night bathroom break. We woke up and walked outside for our bathroom break. We could not believe the stars, but we went back to bed and agreed to stay another night to be able to see the stars even better. The next day we spent listening to music, rock hounding, and taking in the landscape. I kept looking at this one particular ridge and telling my husband that a bright light was shining on it, almost like a strobe. He looked, and it was gone. It was not something I thought of until I saw it a few times, and then I became concerned, as a wilderness first responder, that maybe there was a hiker who was stranded on the ridge. But the areas that light came from changed too often for someone to be traveling by foot or bike. Remember, we are also talking about a far distance in the high desert, but you can see for miles. I think my husband noticed it once, but we eventually brushed it off as light reflecting off rocks or glare. Later that evening, after we made dinner, we sat outside watching the sun set and decided to go back in the van and hang out while it got dark enough to really see all the stars in the Milky Way. It was around 10 or 11 p.m., and we came out, and I immediately looked up, and there was this light that was so bright white and seemed close. I asked if that was the North Star and how it could be so bright and close, I knew how close it was due to my astigmatism making it look the way the Bible images depict it, and he said he wasn't sure but noticed it earlier. We kept walking around our site, looking at the sky and the satellites, and came around the van back to our original spot and looked up. We immediately noticed the light was gone. All of a sudden, we started to notice the light again, but it was moving further away and had a different color. Well, at first we couldn't tell if it was, but then we definitely could tell it was moving. And rapidly. It would jump around almost like a hummingbird would, changing color between yellow, red, and blue. I have seen a lot of different phenomena in my life thus far, so I wasn't particularly worried or shocked, especially since we had just seen the Marfa lights, which looked similar but had more flowing movements. That all changed in the next few moments when the lights started to change colors into monochromatic ranges of deep violet and violet blues with magenta while moving around. It was almost peaceful looking. Soothing even. It started moving closer to us. Changing colors more often, 
blues, violets, pinks, greens. It came down to ground level on the other side of a large juniper. I lost my breath at this point. The juniper was only a short distance from us, and at this point we noticed that it was literally peeking at us from around the juniper just as we were peeking at it from around our van. It moved so much, like. I guess the way to describe it is like a curious child, and it seemed like the light would have been where the face was and as tall as an average male. All of a sudden, I realized how close we were to seeing it, and I became afraid. Why? I don't think I was ready to see it. It's like a big question that's about to be revealed, and are you sure you want to know? You can't go back. The box is open. I may have made a noise or jumped back when the fear set in, and this light creature did not like this. It got very low to the ground, almost cat-like, and was looking through the bushes when it immediately started to pulsate red. The color of aggression scared the ducking shit out of me, to be honest. We ran to the van, jumped in, and locked the doors. Our van has this bubble wrap mylar insulation in the windows during the winter months to keep in the warmth, so we cannot see out of them. At that point, I didn't want to. I was really afraid. I couldn't catch my breath. After we finally calmed down, we decided we needed to look. What person wouldn't? We got out to inspect. Where the light was before, it seemed empty. This was a relief, but it also made me feel like I had made this up. Then I looked to my left, just beyond the fence to the ranch, and noticed several of the same type of lights moving back and forth in greens and blues. They were pretty far away, so I wasn't so worried and felt a little more calm about the situation. They were far enough away, for some reason, I turned towards the ridge I had been looking at earlier that morning and thought I saw something larger moving in the dark. Of course, I told myself that I was nuts and to disregard it, and at that moment, a bright light came on. But it wasn't a light. It was a creature of some sort. It is very similar to something you would imagine from movies that depict alien beings as robots or wearing robotic machines. This machine was large and clearly visible, it was shining its light into the valley where we had just seen the blue and green lights, flashed a couple of times, and then was gone. All the other lights were gone shortly after and did not come back that night. I wish we had thought to grab our phones, but the first one happened so rapidly that it didn't occur to us. I'm still not sure if I'm a believer, but I do admit I love some true horror, and I wanted to share the one encounter I truly cannot explain. I was a scout with Scouting Ireland from age 12 to 16, and one of our most frequently used campsites was Larch Hill in the Wicklow Mountains. The scout leaders liked to tell us scary stories about a woman who haunted the area, most commonly referred to as the Lady of Larch Hill, kind of unimaginative, if you ask me. I wasn't exactly a believer at the time, and I brushed off the stories as just that. I'm going to briefly describe the layout of the campsite. When you drive into the entrance of the campsite, there's a big gravel parking lot with the welcome center and bathrooms to your right. Straight ahead, there's a gravel path that has entrances to fields left and right of it. On this particular occasion, we were camping at the very back field, to the right of the path. There was no lighting installed anywhere in the campsite, apart from the bathrooms and outside of the welcome center, lighting the car park. So, this particular weekend, I must have been 15 at the time, we're camping in the back field. The mess tent is set up near the entrance to the field, which leads out onto the path that goes towards the parking lot. It faces out towards the mountains, and to the left of the mess tent, at the base of the field, surrounded on one side by trees and brush, were our tents. At the time, there were four girls camping, two two-man tents, and a few boy tents scattered around us. Me and my best friend were sharing a tent, and we had gotten into a pointless argument that evening, but I was scared of walking around the campsite on my own in the dark, so that night after everyone had long gone to bed, I asked her to come to the bathrooms, which were a five-minute walk from the campsite, with me. She wasn't talking to me and walked about six feet in front of me, and I sheepishly followed behind. We walked without torches towards the mess tent, as it had a single light hanging from the rail outside of it, lighting the campsite. As we approached it, I walked, looking at the ground, because I didn't want to trip over the tree roots and camping gear that may have been left out for the next morning. I noticed the shadow of a girl to my left, maybe three feet behind me. I automatically assumed one of the other girls had heard us leave and was in the same position as me and scared to walk to the bathroom on her own at night, so I turned around, but there was no one there. When I looked down, the shadow was still there. I remember distinctly thinking it was the shadow of a girl because I could make out long hair and a dress, which I had assumed was a nightgown, it was a warm night, looking at the shadow, back to my own, back to the shadow of my friend, I noticed something, the light, the one singular source of light on a cloudy night where you couldn't see the moon or stars, was hitting us from the right, and my shadow and my friend's shadow stemmed from our feet towards 10 o'clock, while this shadow seemed to be coming from nowhere. I tried to rationalize it in every way physics would allow, 
but I was so freaked out that I closed my eyes and speed walked closer to my friend. We didn't say anything to each other the whole walk down, and once we had gotten past the mess tent and onto the path, we both turned our phone torches on to light the path, which was completely dark all the way up to the bathrooms. We could see lights from other campsites dotted around the place, but none were bright enough or close enough to be of any use in lighting the path. When we got to the bathrooms, I locked myself in a stall and just sat there. My heart was beating out of my chest, and I felt like if I opened the door, someone was going to be standing there, waiting for me. I waited until I heard my friend flush and unlock her stall before I left mine, and I couldn't even look in the mirror as I washed my hands because I was afraid I would see something I didn't want to. We walked back to our tent, and I got into my sleeping bag without saying anything. I barely slept that night, trying to figure out what had happened and if I saw a ghost. To this day, if people ask me if I've ever had a paranormal encounter, I think back to that shadow walking behind me. It gives me chills just writing about it now. The reason I'm sharing about this today is because I was reading through some haunted stories about abandoned places and eerie sites, and I decided to do a quick search to see if anyone else had had a similar experience or if there was any official lore about the Lady of Larch Hill. I found one story written on Love in Dublin by a guy who calls her the Blue Lady and says that he came face to face with her one day, and a story from around 2005 where a few people recall being told the site was haunted, but I couldn't find any info beyond that. The Hoya Bachu Forest is probably the most famous place in Romania and certainly the most famous forest in this country. The place has been known all around the world since 1968, even if the locals have known it as a bad place and have been avoiding it for a really long time. The locals notice that once they enter the forest, something strange and unusual happened to every single one of them. Even from the first steps into the forest, you can experience nausea, anxiety, vomiting, severe headaches, and even skin burns. People believe it to be under a powerful curse and even a place where the devil wanders free. Drawn by the stories about the forest, Alexander Sift, a biologist, started researching the strange occurrences in the 1950s. He reported feeling constantly accompanied and watched by some presences that he called shadows. These shadows would sometimes take the shape of a couple, who would disappear into thin air as soon as they caught sight of him. He somehow managed to catch the man on camera right after the woman had disappeared, just as the man was disappearing himself. The photograph depicts the peculiar being with a stub for an arm and with parts of its body becoming translucent, a phenomenon referred to as dematerialization. Sadly, there are not many pieces of evidence, as the better part of the scholar's collection was stolen and destroyed shortly after he passed away. However, it is said that whatever events may occur are influenced by the person who enters the forest. So, if you are a skeptic, you are likely to get out of the forest unscathed. On August 18, 1968, the military technician Emil Barnea, 45 years old at the time, ignoring the locals' warnings, could be found in the forest, trying to spend a weekend away from the stress of the city. He was there with his girlfriend and the other two friends. Around 1 p.m., while looking for firewood, he heard his friends call his name. Back in the meadow, with his friends, he saw something that looked like an UFO above the forest without making any noise. Then the objects started to shine and move in the air. The photos he took were later classified as the clearest images of an UFO taken in Romania and one of the best images of an UFO taken all around the world. Once you get inside the forest, you have the constant feeling that you are being watched, like you are in a place you certainly don't fit in, like all the unseen creatures are watching you like someone who entered their world. Every person who entered the forest reported these weird feelings. The forest is mostly known for its weird apparitions. Intangible structures or materials of various shapes can be seen at night and during the day. Most of them are impossible to see with the human eye but can be caught on camera. There are also magnetic anomalies, electromagnetic field fluctuations, and infrasound emissions. Some other phenomena are the weird traces that seem to appear on the ground, be it dirt, grass, or snow, just under the eyes of people. Even the plants were affected, showing signs of dehydration, burns, and necrosis of stems and leaves in certain areas of the forest. The most typical appearances are those that loom in the sky above the forest. Suddenly, geometric figures appear in the sky, in flight, in the form of pyramids, spheres, cylinders, cones, and cubes. These geometric shapes have been photographed and filmed hundreds of times. The most spectacular are those in the form of UFOs, pre-UFOs, or quasi-UFOs. The forest is also famous for the fact that within its borders, UFOs invisible to the human eye but which can be photographed are more numerous than UFOs visible to the human eye. It is the only place on earth with these characteristics. People are most frightened by human appearances, such as humanoid heads hidden in the forest. Many tourists freaked out when, 
After developing the photos, they realized they weren't at all alone in the forest because there were hundreds of faces hidden in the background. Sometimes there have been seen in photos figures of deceased persons. Another aspect worth mentioning is the one related to the transient states between gamma and beta radiation, amplified by the magnetic distortions often associated with the appearance of translucent, white humanoid silhouettes. In 1993, the researcher Adrian Petrut identified in the Bachu forest a special area that he called socially active point 3. The area in question seems to be the center of maximum activity for paranormal phenomena. Some other very interesting facts that he claimed to be true are. The phenomena in the Hoya Bachu forest are generally discrete but continuous over time. The forest itself offers more data to researchers than to lovers of spiritism. The phenomena are clearly obvious and undisputed, even by the most skeptical scientists. It seems that there is a connection between the presence in the forest of people with medium capacity and the appearance of mysterious phenomena. The frequency of paranormal phenomena is fluctuating, and the causes of these fluctuations are not yet fully discovered. There is also a general consensus among specialists in parapsychology, according to which the Hoya Bachu forest is an interdimensional gate through which spirits, whether of the recently deceased or still incarnate, can enter the material physical dimension of the planet Earth. However, initiates in the esoteric sciences claim that the Hoya Bachu forest is a portal between the astral and the terrestrial plane, an intermediate area similar to Dante's Purgatory, where the souls of the deceased deepen for 40 days, in which their fate is decided and judged. However, there are many other places worldwide where similar phenomena have been reported, but the Hoya Bachu forest is considered by all great parapsychologists to be the most important area of management of parapsychological phenomena on the entire planet. Another interesting fact is that some locals and tourists also call this place the Bermuda Triangle of Romania. Its name comes from a shepherd who claimed he lost all his flock of 200 sheep in the forest. There are also people who tried to open the gate to another dimension in the forest. If you want to visit the forest, my advice for you is to stick to the set trails and to respect the environment. I was lucky enough to talk to a local once. It seemed to follow him to that day, and he mentioned seeing and feeling things that were beyond his power of understanding. I myself believe blindly in this kind of stuff and have always been drawn to it. I hope this can be of some help to you and that you find answers to some of your questions. The place is truly fascinating, and I am looking forward to visiting it as soon as possible. I was about 15 when these events took place. I remember my friend Mark's dad was really into paranormal investigations, and that kind of fueled the flames. We all wanted to grow up and explore the world. Investigating all kinds of abandoned buildings that hide unknown creatures or entities. We would be better than all of those shows because, unlike them, when shit hit the fan, we would stand our ground and take on whatever came our way. Mark's place was the place to be back then. We would spend days at his place hanging out, playing games, and watching TV to our hearts' desire. One of the weekends, we had the house to ourselves, and it was great. It was Mark, Chuck, Danny, Brendan, and myself. We were trying to kill as much time as we could, waiting for night to fall. You see, one of the most beautiful things about Somerset was the woods. Somerset did have a little center town where it faked a sense of being an actual city, but once you got out of the two miles worth of city, you all of a sudden dropped off the face of the world. Somerset is about 11 square miles large. And I guarantee you that most of that is wood. Some of it is Lake Cumberland, but most of it is wood. When we were at Mark's place, we were about 20 minutes from the next house. Like I said, dropped off the face of the world. 10 years ago, the night finally fell over Somerset. This was finally our time. Our stupid, edgy 15-year-old time. We had been waiting for the night to come because we were going to go explore the woods out behind Mark's house. We were all armed with our flashlights and water bottles, and all of us had knives of some capacity. Mark had also brought some of his guns. Just in case. He had a 12-gauge pump-action shotgun. It may have had six shells in the gun at best. Chuck had a .22 rifle that had a very wimpy single-round capacity. And I had a .22 six-shot revolver. In Somerset, being the backwoods town that it was, it wasn't uncommon to see someone toting around firearms all over the place. Now, it wasn't super common to have 15-year-olds carrying guns, but it would happen from time to time. Plus, we were on private property, so in our minds, it was okay. Like I said, we were stupid kids. Once we were all geared up, it was time for our adventure. As soon as we entered the woods, there was an uneasy tension in the air. The crickets and other wildlife in the area sounded active, which was a good sign. We weren't sure just yet as to what it was that made us feel off, but we would soon find out. We were about 15 minutes in when we found the bridge. This bridge was an old, 
rickety wooden thing that went across a steep trench that was probably about 15 feet deep and went on for at least 50 to 70 feet before twisting around the hills out of sight. It was not exactly a canyon, but it was definitely not something we wanted to go down into. If I did, it would be a pain in the ass to get back up. It didn't seem like an easy way to get back up, we decided to take a quick break while we were there. We set up a small perimeter with a lantern from our pack. We really didn't have any plans for just how long we were going to be out there. So we decided to set up a small campfire and just hang out until it was time to continue. Chuck, Danny, Mark, and Brendan were relaxing and shooting the shit with each other, so I decided to keep watch. I was walking around the perimeter we had set up, shining my flashlight around the woods surrounding us. As I was walking, I noticed something strange. I heard the crunching of the leaves under my feet. And I'm sure someone would say, so what? But that's just it. That's all I heard. Other than the few words here and there from my friends, I heard nothing else. The woods were dead silent. As soon as I noticed the silence, I drew the revolver from its holster. Whatever good the dot .22 was going to do to what I thought was nearby. I continued to shine my flashlight around, trying to remain calm, but then the beam shined onto something just at the edge of the hill. Something was just barely peeking over the edge of the trench. Something that I couldn't quite make out with just the light. But after a few moments of adjustment, I finally could make out what it was. But I wish that I hadn't. The thing's white skin was reflecting the beam from the flashlight, but I could make out a vaguely human-shaped head. Its dark eyes seemed to absorb the light, leaving just soulless voids staring daggers at me. I was frozen in place, locked in eye contact with this creature. Then its head disappeared back into the trench. As soon as I was released from its gaze, I turned back to my friends and tried as quietly as I could to get their attention, but they didn't seem to notice me. They were too enveloped in conversation, probably about something stupid as usual. So after mustering as much sound as I could, I called out, Hey! The crack of my voice echoed through the now silent woods. They all whipped their heads back at me, startled by the sudden sound. After a moment, I finally recollected myself and slowly but frantically pointed out the trench where I saw the thing. There's something in the ditch. I was barely forced out. With that, the rest of my friends quickly got up and drew what weapons they had. All of us were frantically searching the edge of the ditch with our guns trained on the spot. After a few moments of our desperate searching, we finally noticed the thing peek up again. It was about 10 feet closer than it had previously been. It was peeking just slightly more than it was previously. My friends were now caught in the same trance as its voids of eyes stared quickly, moving from one of us to the other. For a moment, it almost looked like it didn't have a mouth, then we all saw it as its tongue came out of a small slit in its face, almost seeming to lick its lips at us. We all stood in that same frozen shock as the thing quickly dipped back down into the trench. It came back up again, another 10 feet closer. It was coming closer to us. I can't remember who yelled to run, but I remember us all running like maniacs back towards Mark's house. So much for standing our ground. I found myself close to the front, right behind Chuck. We ran for what felt like forever. As we ran for what we believed were our lives, I heard Danny and Brendan screaming. I can't remember what it was that they were saying. My ears were ringing, and my lungs were burning. After we finally made it back to Mark's house, seeing his house was the closest feeling to salvation I've ever experienced. We all practically dove into the door, quickly locking the door behind us. After we were finally clear, we all kept our guns trained on the doors and exits, fueled only by adrenaline. It had to have been hours before we all stood with our weapons in our hands, just hoping that the creature wouldn't try to enter the house. Once morning finally came, we were all exhausted. I don't think I was the first person to pass out, but I know I was the last person to wake up. Everyone else was sitting quietly in the living room. It took hours before we decided to talk about what happened. Danny and Brendan explained that as we were running, they could hear heavy steps running behind them. We couldn't rationalize what it was that we saw, so we all decided not to talk about it with anyone else. Again, a stupid decision, I know. But we were terrified teenagers. We also decided that we were never going out into the woods behind Mark's house again. I never did go back out to those woods, and our investigation team plans unfortunately fell apart. We all moved to different places later in our lives and slowly grew apart. The only people I really keep in contact with anymore are Chuck and Mark. But I haven't seen either of them in years. There are many things that I question when I look back at that night. What could it have been? Why couldn't we move? Was it just some animal that looked monstrous in the light? But the thing that always confuses me is how it moved. It just kept bobbing up and down out of a 15-foot trench. I don't know how it could have kept climbing up and down. Unless it was just ducking. Yesterday, me and my wife planned on going on a 4-mile hike. 
The trail makes a big loop, with the beginning point also acting as the ending point. The story begins in the trail parking lot. There were about five other cars in the lot, and out of the car nearest us came a middle-aged couple. We paid them no mind, as we typically do with strangers, and as we headed off to the restroom before hitting the trail, they set off on their own hike. When we started the hike, we chose route number one, doing the loop counterclockwise. The trail itself makes a huge loop about four miles in length, with the parking lot being at the highest elevation and the lowest point being in the middle of the trail. The ascent from the bottom middle section to the top going either direction consists of giant limestone canyons that require a good bit of rock climbing, making them extremely steep, slow, slippery, and tough. This is important information for later. About 20 minutes into our overall 3-hour hike, we reached point A, where we caught up with the older couple. About the time we caught up to them in the canyon, they decided to turn back towards the parking lot, passing us along the way. We exchanged smiles and waves as we passed, and again, we thought nothing of it. From point A to point B, everything seemed totally normal. We were hot and tired, of course, but we were enjoying ourselves and thinking very little about the other couple. When we reached point B, about 2-3 RDS of the way through the loop, just starting the uphill climb back towards the parking lot, however, things started to get a little weird. As soon as we exited the low-lying canyon region, we saw the same couple heading towards us, as if they had returned to the parking lot and opted instead for route number 2. We still didn't find this to be completely out of the ordinary, as the first canyon, around point A, was tough to get down, and it seemed they were somewhat unprepared. The woman was wearing a knee-length skirt, a very bad choice for sliding down slippery canyon slopes and climbing steep rock bluffs, and it appeared they had not brought a pack with water or anything. We passed them again, exchanged pleasantries, and continued on. This time, though, we did talk briefly about the situation. We found it odd that they made it far enough to meet us at this point, as the first parts of routes 1 and 2 were steep and slow, and the area between points A and B was pretty flat and steady. Considering the difference in terrain and their age, and the fact that the woman was wearing a knee-length blue jean skirt with slipperish shoes, we agreed it was awfully strange to see them at that point on the trail, but we continued on anyway, just shrugging and thinking no more about it. Soon afterwards, we made it to the outlook, which was a couple hundred feet above the bottom section of the trail and 10 minutes past point B. As we paused to take some pictures and catch our breath, my wife pointed out that she could hear their voices down below in the canyon as we rested. We listened and mutually agreed that it was probably the same couple since the point the voices seemed to come from would be about the right spot for them to be at given the last location we saw them at and the lack of anyone else on the trail so far. Still, nothing too strange yet. That is, until we reach point C. Between the outlook and point C, which was 20 minutes from the end of the loop and 40 minutes from point B, there was a wide, gravel trail with steep drop-offs on either side. You could say it was sort of a ridge, as everything within the loop made a giant bowl much like a volcano, with the elevation difference between the lowest point of the trail and the highest point of the trail being about 500 feet. This made the terrain around the trail seem pretty impassable. It was extremely steep and covered in thick undergrowth and fallen trees. It seems to be pretty much a given that the established trail is the only way to get from the outlook back to the parking lot. As we neared point C, we were becoming increasingly exhausted and ready to be done. We stopped once or twice for about 30 seconds apiece to catch our breath, and as we got closer and closer to point C, it was as if the energy was sucked out of us both. Of course, the trail was tough, but we had done it and many others like it before, and it was not even 80 degrees outside. Even as our mental focus began to waver and we started noticing a significant change in our demeanor and attitude, we still marched on, knowing the end of the trail was near. When we reached point C, everything changed for the worse. Now keep in mind that we saw the older couple about 40 minutes earlier at point B, and there was no way to reach point C from there except the trail we were currently on. There were no shortcuts, there was no realistic way to pass us without our knowledge, and there was no way to possibly beat us there. And yet, there they were. Sitting on a bench on the side of the trail, calmly eating lunch at that. Even if they did find some way to get there before us, they didn't have a drop of sweat on them, and their demeanor did not at all fit the situation. They should have either not been there at all. As we passed them, the man mentioned something about a picnic to us and smiled, laughing. We tried our best to respond in kind, but the mood was as if we had just walked into a giant black cloud of smoke. I don't know how else to explain it, but the area around them disoriented us completely, and we no doubt were pale as ghosts and obviously shaken. We passed on by them, and as soon as we were out of earshot, my wife turned to me with a face I had never seen before in my life. We were terrified. Without saying a word to each other, we both experienced the same feeling of shock. It felt as if we had just walked through a time warp, 
or as if we had brushed against another dimension. Our following discussion amounted to this. There is no way they could have beaten us there. Sure, maybe, possibly, just might be, there was a chance. But only if, after seeing us at point B, they sprinted through the woods in a direct line towards point C now this would require them to run up the second canyon, through steep rock bluffs, through unmarked woods, and who knows what else for over a mile. In under 40 minutes. That's how long it took us to get there going at a pretty good speed using the clear trail, which, as a crow flies, was not that much longer than a direct route from B to C. We are in our early 20s and in decent shape, and we were dead tired by the time we saw them, and based on their apparent level of preparedness and fitness, no judgment here, only stating what we could see, there is no way, even if they did take a direct off the trail route, they could have made it there before us. On top of that, they had somehow found two Bud Lights and a lunchbox full of sandwiches on the way and were already almost done eating them by the time we met them at point C. All of these things, combined with the overwhelming feelings we got when we encountered them at point C, have left us in mental shambles for the past day. It took us six to eight hours to fully recover and regain our sense of normalcy. Shaken is an understatement. The hairs on our neck stood on end, and we felt almost ill. We have no idea what to make of this and no clue how to explain it in a way that even begins to make sense. Please. Help us figure out what this was or who they were.